So have you ever found yourself in a situation where you just get so frustrated and you think, you know what, <laughs> there's gotta be a better way to handle this? Have you ever been so exasperated that you've either already blown up, you're about to blow up, and you finally stop and pause and say, there's gotta be a better way to go about this? And, and you kind of look at what's going on, the climate of just hate that exists in our country right now, where there's this rhetoric of hate, and there's this hostility and incivility and negativity and just kind of doomsday language all around us. And, and it's a very divided country we live in right now. And you've got to you step back and you just kind of go, there's got to be a better way to go about life because whatever we're doing isn't really working right now. And we're right around the corner from elections. And so we've been inundated with political ads. And if you happen to have the TV on at all, you just kind of go, oh my goodness. And do the politicians not get it? None of these ads endear us to them. And, and it just drives you crazy. And you may think you've had to watch a lot of political ads over the last number of days, but the study says Phoenix, Arizona sees more political ads than any place else in the country. Not totally sure why, but they said actually there was a period of time between September 3rd, October 16th, where they had to endure 41,000 political ads across the airways. That's not even just a few weeks leading up to the election. And, and so 41,000 ads in about a five or six week period, and it just drives you nuts, and you go, there's gotta be a better way. And Terry Briggs, who lives in Phoenix, actually, she said this. She said, I'm sick of it. I don't even like to watch TV anymore. I'm muting it constantly because I can't stand to hear the political advertisements. I've told you this before, but several years ago, I just got so fed up with all of it, I quit watching the news at all on TV and even reading much about it. But it's not even about politics, and it's not even just organizations, there's just all this hostility going on. It's individuals too, you and me, and we just get hostile so quickly. And how many of you have heard the name Anna King before? Anna King actually, on a Wednesday night just a few weeks ago, she flew into the Miami International Airport, grabbed her gold hard shell suitcase off the baggage carrel, carousel, went home, opened up her bag, and when she opened up her bag, she was shocked to find that none of her belongings were in her bag. Instead, they'd all been replaced with airline equipment, and so things like orange reflective jackets and harnesses and power strips and work boots, and so she sees this. Immediately, she goes nuts. I mean, why wouldn't she? All of her stuff is gone. It's been replaced with this equipment, and so she goes ballistic. She gets on Twitter right away, and she tweets this. She says, I'm, she says never, never, capital letters, fly with American Airlines again. All of my items were taken out of my luggage and replaced with airport equipment, and all they did was tell me to fill out a form. I'm, she's hot, she's upset, but she goes on, and she says, this is outrageous. Please, repost this. Don't book flights with them. American Airlines, hashtag American Airlines, hashtag NBC News, hashtag ABC News, hashtag travel, hashtag robbed. And that's kind of how she's feeling at that point. But she's not done. She goes on, and she just talks about the fact that all of her souvenirs from her trip were taken. And she says, priceless souvenirs from my trip are gone. She said $8,000 worth of souvenirs from her trip. That caused me to pause a little bit, because I, I've been on trips, and we've gotten souvenirs. But none of them are priceless, and they weren't $8,000. But hers were expensive, and they were nicer than the kind of things that we have. In a follow-up tweet, she said, I'm just in tears over this, and the police are investigating. And, and again, you go, who can blame her? I mean, that's awful. And so all that hostility, it, it seems to be warranted. But then Thursday morning, all of that was just Wednesday night. Thursday morning, American Airlines actually solves the crime. Turns out, Anna had actually taken the wrong bag. It wasn't even her bag, and, and she'd taken the wrong suitcase off the carousel and left hers behind, and she kind of goes, oops. And so her response to the whole thing, this is her apology, a jet lag, jet lag must have taken its toll. I was just kind of going crazy, and, and she was. And, and that's about all that she came up with for an apology. And that's what we do. We go nuts. And we begin to blame everybody else, and we make accusations, and we attack the people around us, and we demonize everybody that looks different, acts different, thinks differently than us. And most often, we make fools of ourselves, and we become uncivil in our responses and, and in our actions towards others. And you step back, and you go, there's got to be a better way to go about this. And so this summer... I actually found myself just more frustrated by all of this, just disgusted by all of it. And I came across some words while reading the Bible one morning as I was kind of following the Bible reading plan that we have here at church. I mean, we talk all the time about reading the Bible. We just encourage you, open it up, read it, read it every day. Find a chair that works for you, a place that's quiet where you can settle into and just consistently read the Bible every day. It doesn't have to take long. 
but it's just kind of get into this consistent pattern. And so for, ever, for several years, my chair was actually an exercise bike in our basement, but for the last couple of years, it hasn't been the exercise bike. My chair has kind of been my bed the last couple of years. And I've been waking up about four, sometimes five o'clock in the morning, I can't fall back to sleep. And so I pull out my phone and I've kind of made myself a deal where I said I won't read anything else, do anything else, play any games until I've actually read the Bible on my phone. And, and so I, I do that. I follow the LCBC reading plan. You can do that too. I mean, it's real easy. Just download the LCBC app and you'll find the reading plan on the app. Pick up translation of the Bible. Get U version Bible on your phone. Pick a translation that's easy. Right now I'm reading from just the message and it's just a great way to read the Bible. It makes it come to life and I love it. And so find your chair, your quiet place where you can read the Bible and start reading it. So July... I'm frustrated, I'm disgusted at all the incivility that's kind of going on around us. It's four o'clock in the morning, I'm laying in bed wide awake, grab my phone, and I begin to read from the reading plan, and I come across these words. And I'd been laying there thinking, there's got to be a better way. And so all of a sudden, I read these words, but now I want to lay out for you a far better way. And so instantly, I sit up in bed, and I go, okay, this is going to be good. I want to know what this better way is. And I couldn't wait as I read the rest of the words to kind of show you as well. And so that's why today we start this new series we've entitled A Better Way. And so let me ask you to grab a Bible. There's some of the seats there around you. I'll tell you the page number, all of our locations, there should be Bibles around you. You can open up the Bible on your phone if you want to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's page 878. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, page 878. I'm actually reading from the New Living Translation. That's what the Bibles are there in your seats. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Go all the way to the end of chapter 12, the very end, very last part of the last verse. And it says this, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Let me show you a way of life that's best of all. Now, a man named Paul is actually writing this. Paul is a man whose life was radically changed when he had this encounter with Jesus. This encounter came after Jesus had died, after he rose from the dead, and Paul actually has this encounter with Jesus, and it changes his life. And so Paul says, let me show you a superior way to live your life. And and so as I read this, as I'm laying in bed, I'm going, okay, bring it. I want to know what this way is. Show me. And so he goes on, chapter 13, verse 1. He says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and, all, and of all the angels, but didn't love others, I would, not, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Let me just stop and say Paul's actually talking about some gifts that God gives his followers. They're known as spiritual gifts, and Paul says you could have some of the greatest gifts imaginable in life, but if you do not have love, these gifts mean nothing. He said you could have anything and everything that you might possibly want to possess in your life, but without love, all of these things need mu- mean nothing at all. And Paul says, look, you want to know what's superior? You want to know the better way of life? He says superior to everything else is love. It's responding to the situations around us in love. He says, that's the better way. Not just better way, far better way. Not just far better. He says, it's superior. It's the best way possible to respond to others. It's better than complaining. It's better than fighting. It's better than protesting. It's better than pointing out the flaws of people on social media. It's better than criticizing everything another person does or says. It's better than screaming as loudly as you can to make sure everybody else hears and knows how unhappy you are about life. He just says it's a superior way, and that way is love. And what he says is love wins every time. Love wins with your spouse, love wins with your kids, love wins at work, love wins with your neighbors, love wins at school, love wins in politics, love wins with your enemies. He says just love wins. And, and I hear all that and I see all that. And the problem is, I don't know about you, but I've noticed for me, when I'm wronged, when I feel threatened, my most natural response is not love. It just doesn't kind of ooze out of me naturally. It doesn't come naturally for me. And I can talk about love, and I can sing about love, and I can even teach about love, but, but love is not my first natural response. And because it doesn't come naturally to me and probably to you, then I think Paul feels this necessity to actually describe what it looks like. So he goes on in verse four, and he says, let me just paint a picture for you. This is what the better way of love looks like. Verse four, 
Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And I look at all that, and I go, oh, that's, that's nice, Paul, but man, that's not me. That's not natural. I mean, something like this, it's not a normal person that does that. I mean, look at it again, the list. Verse four, love is patient and kind. I go, uh, uh. sometimes uh, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Uh, you know, man, rude comes in there a lot. It does not demand its own way. I like to have my own way. It's not irritable, but I get that way sometimes, and it keeps no record of being wrong, but, but sometimes I like to keep score and know where people stand and does not rejoice at injustice, but... And I like it sometimes when people that are against me stumble and I rejoice at that and never gives up, never loses faith, endures through every circumstance. And I go, that's not natural for me. And maybe it's a better way, but man, I don't know that it's possible for me. And it's not natural. This kind of living, it's only possible when God's spirit is living and working inside of us. And we receive God's spirit when we trust Jesus as our savior and instantly we're given God's spirit who lives inside of us. And and when we allow God's spirit that's living inside of us to control us, when we open up our hands and say, okay, God, I can't live this way. It doesn't work for me, but I'm gonna open up my hands and say, you control me now. God, allow your spirit inside of me to control me, to guide me, to live this particular way. Then then maybe it's possible, but I can't do it on my own. It's not natural for me. And You know, it's interesting. Later on, there's actually another passage in the book of Galatians that describes almost the same kind of characteristics. We call them the fruit of the Spirit. And the idea of the fruit of the Spirit is these are the things that come when you're allowing God's Spirit to control your life. And so peace and patience and kindness and not being rude, those are all evidences that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding your life. And Paul says, look, This is the better way. It's a superior way to do life. Go to verse eight, second part of verse eight. Paul says, look, love will last forever. Go to verse 13. He says, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is actually love. The greatest of all, he says, it's love. That's the superior way. But it's not natural. But when we live that way, it's noticed. Came across a letter by a guy named Josh Rogers. He was actually telling a story. Standing in line at a mall in Washington, D.C., he was standing behind a traffic cop from Washington, D.C. So he remarked to her as they're standing in line, he said, oh man, your job must be incredibly dangerous. He said, people in D.C., they drive so crazy, was his comment to her. And her response was, don't feel sorry for me. If you want to feel sorry for somebody, feel sorry for the people in parking enforcement, the meter maids. They get screamed at, spat at, cursed out, you name it. She said, it's horrible. Josh said he never really thought that much about meter maids, parking enforcement cops. Never really had any sympathy for them. And he said, in his eyes, they weren't even people. They were more of a nuisance. They were a problem. And never really had opportunity to speak to a park, parking enforcement officer before. But just a few days after that, conversation. He had a chance. He was walking to his office, saw this very serious and stern looking parking enforcement officer rolling down the street on her Segway. And so right as she was passing him, he actually said, excuse me, ma'am. And so she wheels around on her Segway and and he says, look, I just want to thank you for what you do. And the woman stopped and she kind of clutched her chest and she said, oh my goodness, I didn't know what you were about to say. And Josh said, you know what? I'm sure you didn't. I know a lot of people hassle you, they scream at you, they tell you off. The thing is, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be able to find a parking space when everything gets busy, you know? And she said, that's right. And she seemed to pick up a little bit like her job was finally making sense to her. And she said, thank you so much for saying that. Nobody's ever thanked me before. And the next morning, Josh actually runs into the same parking enforcement cop. And this time when she sees him, she burst into a big smile. She said, hey, that's my buddy, my friend. And Josh later reflecting, he said, you know what? I want to make more buddies like her. To embrace people on the fringes, the irritable guy in the neighborhood, the awkward 12-year-old at church, the, the withdrawn dad who sits alone at the soccer games, the quiet janitor who cleans people's urine in the bathroom at the office. He said, I want to make more buddies 
like her. And he just stepped out in love, the superior way, the better way. And, but it's not natural. It doesn't come natural for us. Now, Paul believes in this whole thing of love so much. He writes about it a lot. Go back to Romans chapter 13. It's page 867. A few pages back, Romans chapter 13, page 867. I want you to see what he says in, in this particular passage. Again, he's still talking about love. He's serious about this. It's not just kind of a passing fancy for him. Chapter 13, verse 8, he says this. He says, owe no, nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of the law. For the commandments say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not wrong, do wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. He says, you know what, if you just love other people, you'll fulfill all the other laws. You won't murder, you won't covet, you won't commit adultery, you won't wrong the people around you. Love is the superior way. He just says, look, love doesn't do wrong to others. And so he just says, it's a superior way, it's the best way to go. And I look at this and I go, but it's still so hard. Go to chapter 12, just one page over. Let me begin reading verse nine. Paul says, don't pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those that are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and do not think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And... Paul's just saying this, this thing about love, it's real. He said, just do it. It's the superior way, better way. He said, don't retaliate. Don't think you've always got to get back at somebody else. And again, this is so hard for me to do. It doesn't come natural for me to do this at all. And, and in case you think this is just kind of a hobby horse that Paul is on, that he's just on this kick of telling people to love others, Jesus actually said the same thing. Jesus believed the same thing. Go back to Matthew chapter 5, page 737. I want you to see the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter five, page 737. In the Bible's there at your seats. I'm gonna begin reading in verse 38. This is Jesus talking, and he says this, verse 38. He said, you've heard the law that says the punishment must match the in injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And we go, yeah, that's, that's retaliation, let's get back. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, Offer the other cheek also. If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard, the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Jesus is turning the whole thing around. Pray for those who persecute you, and that way you'll be acting as true children of the Father in heaven, for he gives the sunlight to both the evil and the good, Light, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike, if you love only those who love you, what reward will that be? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you're, you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Jesus just takes it to a whole new level. And there's a lot of debate about how far Jesus is actually saying we should go with this. Does this mean? that I really ought to turn the other cheek and say, smack me again? Does this mean that we never stand up for ourselves? Does this mean that we ought to be pacifists? Does this mean that we should let people walk all over us? And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is just making a point. He's saying it's gotta be different than it is now, and he's using very strong language to make his point, maybe even using some hyperbole here, because just a few minutes before, the words of Jesus, he also said, look, if you're doing something and your eye sees something, and what you see with your eye causes you to stumble, causes you to do something wrong, causes you to sin, gouge your eye out. 
And then right after they said, if your hand, and he says, your strong hand, for me it'd be your left hand. If your strong hand does something to cause you to stumble, to do something wrong, to sin, cut your hand off. And I don't think he's saying really gouge your eye out. I don't think he's really saying cut your hand off. He's just making a very strong point to say, you don't want to go down that road. Don't do it. And he uses the same kind of strong language here. And he says, look, just love others. Love others. I mean, he says, look, love others. And, and then he makes another statement. Don't expect to be repaid. Don't do it just because you think you're going to get something back for it. That's not why you're to love others. He says it's just the right thing. And then he kind of gives this list of what to do. And so he says, look, don't return insult for insult and retaliation. Which, man, that's what comes natural for me. You come after me, I, I'll come back at you. And instead he says, offer the other cheek. He says, look, do more than is expected. If they're asking for your shirt, give them your coat. Go further with this. Talks about going the extra mile. Offer to do more than expected. Carry it not just one mile, that bag for that soldier. Carry it two miles. He's just saying go to the extreme with all of this. He says give to those who ask. He says don't just love your friends. Love your enemies as well. Go to the extreme with all of this as Jesus is talking. In other words, whatever negativity is coming your way, whether, whatever incivility is around you is coming your way, do the unnatural thing. Don't retaliate, respond with love. Even when everyone around you is getting louder and louder, even when everything seems to point to the fact that rudeness is the way to respond to rudeness, and, and even in order to get your own way, even when it seems like you ought to be demanding your own way, you say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna follow Jesus' way on this one, and it's not the natural way to respond, and everything inside of us is screaming to get loud, and do what everybody else is doing, and everything inside of us is screaming that my voice deserves to be heard, and everything inside of me is screaming that I deserve to be respected, and I demand to be heard, and, and if I do what comes natural, I'm not gonna do the better way. What comes natural is just exploding. That's why two-year-olds explode. Nobody had to teach them to do that. They don't throw tantrums in the grocery store because they had a class on how to throw tantrums and embarrass your parents in the grocery store. They're just doing what comes natural. And if we do what comes natural, we're gonna explode and we're gonna throw tantrums and we're doing that all around us now. And Jesus says there's a better way and that way is love. And Jesus says we can change the world if we will be willing to do what's not natural to us. And so for us as followers of Jesus, he says there's a better way. We don't have to follow our instincts here. So I read all this and I go, okay, so what's the natural response? And what's the appropriate response to what Jesus is saying here? How do I respond to all this? And I would say for some of us, if we've been going a particular direction and we've been returning insult for insult and we've been fighting back with incivility and rudeness just like everybody else and we've been going down that road and demanding our way and getting louder and louder and we're retaliating against those that stand against us. Bottom line, we've just been doing what comes natural. I think what God is saying to us is, you need to turn around. Turn around and go a different direction, a better way. A direction, he says, this is the direction that I want you to walk. And you say, but everybody else is going this way. But Jesus is saying, but you're not like everybody else. You have inside of you, if you're my follower, my spirit. And my spirit will help you turn and my spirit will help you take steps in the superior way, the right direction. You say, but everybody else is going this way. They can't help it. There's not a spirit inside of them of God's spirit that's helping them turn. They're just doing what comes natural. That's their only choice. But God says, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we have a choice. And we can turn and we can allow God's spirit to help us do what comes unnatural to us and stop going the path that everybody else is going and turn and go a new direction. There's actually a word in the Bible that describes us turning around and we like to use it on other people. We don't like to think it about ourselves, but the word is repentance and, and repentance just means turn around. Turn around and follow Jesus. And some of us, a lot of us, maybe all of us have been going down this road we're doing what comes natural and we're doing what everybody else has been doing and this is the way to respond to incivility with more incivility. And Paul says and Jesus says there's got to be a better way and there is a better way, a far better way, a superior way. So turn around and begin to take steps and begin to follow God's way and if anyone's going to change the climate in our country, it starts with you and me. We're the ones that have God's spirit living inside of us. We're the ones that have the power to make it possible and if we would follow Jesus on this one, 
And if we would begin to love even our enemies, would it make a difference? I don't, I don't know. I would like to think if 17,000 of us around LCBC were to say, okay, let's stop going this direction, let's go this direction, I would love to think that somehow that would be noticed, that it would make a difference. And, and I would love to think that if Jesus says, look, this is the superior way to go, go this way, that somehow it's gonna change things. But it may not. And that's why I think Jesus says, it may not make a difference. You may not get repaid with love. You might get more hate. You might get more incivility. But he said, you don't do it because you're gonna get repaid. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And for me, that's a hard pill to swallow because I like to win and I like to retaliate. I don't like to get stepped on. If you step on me, I wanna come back at you and I wanna be heard just as much as the rest of us. But Jesus says, you know what? Don't do that, David. Love anyway. Change directions. So maybe the biggest thing you and I can do in response to what Jesus is telling us is just to stop and change directions. And that may mean we've got to step back and say, okay, Holy Spirit, inside of me, you're going to have to help me do this because I can't do this on my own. So I'm opening up my hands and saying, you lead me. You guide me here. Help me take steps, just little steps so that I don't respond the way it comes natural, but instead I respond in the way of love. And, and then you begin to take steps, little steps. You take steps at home, you take steps at school, you take steps at work, you take steps in just the country and the political climate and all the mess that's going on, just the nastiness. And you don't respond in nastiness. You respond in love. And can I tell you a step that we can take as a church? Just a little step. As we decide, look, let's stop going this way, let's turn and go this way. A little step that we can actually take that I think will make a difference. And one of the cool things about being a part of a big church of 17,000 people is collectively, if we decide to do something, it can make a difference. There's power in numbers. And so Paul, who we've been reading, actually later writes a letter to a guy named Timothy. Paul was mentoring Timothy. Timothy's a young leader. And he's leading the church. And so Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, look, I want you to tell the people in your church what they can do that will make a difference. And he actually says, I want you to tell the rich people in your church. And as soon as we hear that, we all go, oh, then that's not me. I'm not rich, so I don't have to listen to this. And yet, when you look at rich, by world standards, every single one of us in this room is rich. Uh, we can't deny it. And so Paul says, look, Timothy, I just want you to tell the people in your church, this is what they can do. Here's a step they can take from going this way to this way, just a small step to make a difference. And so this is what he actually says. First Timothy chapter five, he says, look, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always ready to share with others. He says, be rich in good works. Do things for other people, even though they may not pay you back. Be rich in good works, expect nothing in return. Paul's just saying, look, be generous. And so look, here's how we can do this together as a church. I actually wanna challenge all of us to be rich in just showing love to people in our communities. And this isn't the first time we've challenged each other to be rich this way. We've actually done this for the last four or five years. And the reason we practice this together is because someday I hope all of us will stop going this way, we'll go this way. And when other people look at you and they talk about you, they'll say, oh man, she is somebody that walks in love. I mean, they're just so loving and kind and not nasty and civil. And they describe you and, and they comment on how you love other people. And so here's how we do it at LCBC. Rather than going out and trying to start all of our own kind of social services, rather than going out and trying to start our own food pantries, or rather than going out and trying to put food or clothes closets in all of our buildings, or rather than going out and starting our own after-school programs for kids, we decided rather than replicate what's already going on in the community and compete with what's going on, why don't we just come alongside and partner with organizations in our communities, organizations that are already doing extraordinary jobs, making a difference in our organizations, let's partner with them. And in most cases, partnering means we give money to them, in most cases, it means we give manpower to them. This year, we're actually partnering with 85 organizations across our 12 locations. We've vetted these organizations that they're doing a good job, a great job in the community. So let's come alongside them. Let's not compete with them. And let's see if we can give them resources. Let's see if we can give them manpower. And these are organizations involved from everything, from foster care to, to hunger to housing to medical care to education to care for the elderly. And so what we do is all year long, we kind of send manpower to them and resources to them. But once a year, and today is the day, we say let's just inject and infuse just a bunch of resources their way to encourage and help them in what they're doing. And 
And what do we respect, expect in return from them? Nothing at all. There's no strings attached. We're just saying, hey, you're doing a great job. And we want to come alongside you and love you. And so today we have the opportunity to give to 85 partner organizations across all of our locations. So here's how we do it. If you've been around the last four or five years, you know how we do it. About five years ago, we came up with a number of $39.95. Don't ask me how that number came up. It's just $39.95. And we kind of challenged each other. And we said if every single one of us would give $39.95, man, how much money could we raise financially just in one weekend to be able to be a financial boost to all of our 85 partner organizations. And so that's still the challenge. We haven't gone up with inflation. It's still $39.95, a one-time gift. And the challenge is today, before you leave the building, for you to give $39.95. $39.95, that's less than a meal out for you as a family. Even if you're a couple, it's less than a meal out. It's a week's worth of coffee for you at Starbucks. It's, It's less than your data plan on your cell phone. And Some of you can do a lot more than this. I hope you will. Some of you, you'd say, you know what? If I could, I would. In the past, I have. In the future, I will. Right now, it just doesn't work for me. And if that's that's you, then that's okay. That's fine. But for the rest of us, if we're going to make a difference as a church in our communities, then we need everybody to play in this. And so whether it's kids, parents, singles, families, doesn't matter. 100% of what's given in the Be Rich gift today is it goes to all these organizations. None of it, there's no administrative fees, there's no strings attached, there, there's no shipping and handling fees that are gonna be applied to it. It's just straight to all these organizations in our communities. And one more thing I'll just say, if you happen to have a lot of money, meaning everybody around you goes, oh, they're rich, they're, they're rich. Then, or if you're a part of a family foundation and every year you sit down at the end of the year and you try to figure out where are we gonna give money this year, then can I tell you, we've actually done you a favor because we've already vetted 85 organizations that are doing a good job and you can actually give directly to them and 100% of it will go to these organizations. None of it stays here and you go, I don't know that I wanna give very much because it'll blow up the budget. And I say, blow up the budget then, that's okay do that. And you may say, well, it's going to make everybody else's gift of $39.95 look small. It doesn't matter. We want you to participate, and you could make a huge, huge difference. And can I just challenge one other group? It's the 2,000 or more of you that watch online with us every weekend. And I just say, we've already made it easy for you to come to church. I mean, you don't even have to get dressed up. You're in your living room. You're watching TV, and you don't have to drive. There's no gas involved. We're saving you money and gas, more than $39.95, I'm sure. And so I would just tell you, you can join us as well, and you jump on, and you give online, and, and when we give today, everybody wins. And So I want to tell you how to give. Before I do it, let me just tell you what's happened in the past over the last couple of years. Last year, the number that was given was $403,331.52 that just goes straight into the community. Uh, over the last five or so years, the number's actually $4.8 million that's been injected into the community, and, and just kind of a real cool thing. And so here's how we do it. Um, my challenge is before you even get to your car, you need to give. Because what will happen is you'll get in your car, you'll forget. And, and so in our atrium and all of our locations, there's actually balloons. You're going to find balloons all around the atriums. And so the white balloons, if you want to give by credit card, green balloons, you can get cash or check. I think there's envelopes even in the programs, but you can give that way. Easiest way is actually on the app. If you don't have it, download it, go to the website. You can text and give that way. I actually tried it out yesterday, and man, within 30 seconds, I was able to give for Ruth and I, so it's easy, easy to do, but my challenge is do it before you leave. And because once you get home, you're gonna forget, and, and it's really easy to do to let love win. And the kind of projects we do, I'll just tell you a couple real quick that I've had the opportunity to be a part of. One of the first years we did this, and what we do is we go out into the community and we ask people, and we ask community leaders, who's doing a good job of making a difference in our community? And then we say, how can we help them? So one of the communities around us, they said, you know what, there's a retirement facility here that does an amazing job. They're kind of the last stop for people that have no place else to go. If they didn't go here, they'd be out on the streets. But they said they've got an issue. They've got a sewer problem, and and it's going to cost them about $100,000 to fix their sewers. They don't have the money to do that. If they don't fix it, we're going to have to shut them down. And they're doing a great job. And so we went to that organization, and we watched how they were working, and they're doing a great job. They just didn't have any money. So because of Be Rich, we had the opportunity to take them a check for $100,000 and say, fix the sewer system. Keep doing what you're doing. You're making a difference. So it could be a big project like that. Another project that's totally different. If you've heard of Schrader 
Schreiber Pediatrics. Um, every year they do their fundraising by having this rubber ducky float. They, you buy a little rubber ducky and it floats down the Susquehanna River and if you win, I don't know what you get, but anyway, they raise a lot of money that way. But they had a problem. Their rubber duckies weren't floating anymore. They were sinking and so nobody was winning and they were struggling. They just said, we need new rubber duckies. So we write them a check and we buy them new rubber duckies. And it's those kind of things and just say, look, no strings attached. You're doing a great job. We wanna love on you. We wanna support you. Love wins. Love makes a difference. Jesus says there's a better way, a far better way, a superior way to do life. Turn around. Turn around. So my challenge to you, maybe, maybe you've been going that way. And everybody else around you is going that way and it feels right, but it's not right. And you know it's not right. Turn around. Allow God's spirit to lead you to do what comes not naturally, but was very unnatural to you. And begin to experience a better way of life and maybe a step for you. I hope a step for you. Jump in today with a gift of 39.95 and let's just see what happens. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us and, and telling us how to do life. And God, you're telling us today there is a better way to do life. It doesn't have to be all this incivility. It doesn't have to be all the nastiness that goes on around us. At least we don't have to jump into it. We don't have to respond that way. We can live differently. Thank you that you realize it's not natural for us to respond with love. And so God, thank you that your Holy Spirit is living inside of us. Now I ask that you give us the courage to relinquish control of our lives and just say, okay, Spirit, lead me here. Can't do this on my own. I need you to lead me and guide me. And so, Father, as we do, may we start taking steps in a whole different direction. And someday when people look at us, may they say, man, she knows how to love people. He knows how to love people. He's not rude. He doesn't retaliate. God, even today, may we be able to pull some money together to make a difference in our communities. And may our communities know that they're loved because of what we do today, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen.